Welcome to the State Historical Society of Iowa's Iowa Stories Lecture. My name is Hang Nguyen, and today we are honored to host Daryl W. Bullock of Bristol, England, who will speak about the Cherry Sisters from Marion, Iowa. A few housekeeping notes before proceeding with our program. We are celebrating the 175th anniversary of Iowa statehood this year, and the month of March has been designated as Iowa History Month. Our colleagues in Des Moines will offer Iowa History 101 webinars, including tomorrow's talk on the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic and a program on actress Donna Reed featuring her daughter, Mary Ann Owen, next Thursday, March 25th. Look for our next Iowa Stories lecture at noon on Thursday, April 8th, when Beth Cody will lecture on Iowa gardens of the past. Today's presentation, which will last approximately 40 minutes, followed by question and answers, is being recorded for later viewing on our website. We encourage you to submit any questions via the chat box for a moderated Q&A session. Please keep your microphones muted and closed captioning is available at the bottom of your screen. I'd like to thank Anu Tawari, Allison Johnson, Mary Bennett, and Charles Scott for their technical assistance today and acknowledge the support of Emily McLean, Michael Moraine, and Jeff Morgan in promoting this event. Daryl Bullock is a writer, publisher, and editor specializing in music and the arts. He is the author of six books, including The Infamous Cherry Sisters, The Worst Act in Vaudeville, published in 2019. Mr. Bullock's other works include Florence Foster Jenkins, The Life of the World's Worst Opera Singer, and the critically acclaimed David Bowie Made Me Gay, 100 Years of LGBT Music. His latest book, The Velvet Mafia, was published in February 2021. Today, Mr. Bullock will chronicle the Cherry Sisters' lives and career, beginning with their life on the farm, important milestones including their early concerts, the Audible Chronicle case, their later life in retirement, their return to the stage, and their final years. Iowa Stories lectures are des designed to draw attention to the value and relevancy of the State Historical Society of Iowa's collections, which preserve scarce pieces of evidence that illuminate stories almost erased by time. Those who appreciate learning about Iowa history and life in the Midwest often overlook the painstaking, sustained effort of those who worked quietly behind the scenes to document the entire gamut of human experience in Iowa. As librarians and archivists, we develop and maintain the research collections required for authors to write scholarly books and articles, for educators to update curriculum with primary sources, for curators to prepare exhibits, for visual artists who are producing films and television shows, or for local communities to protect their historical buildings. We take pride in the essential role we play in the success of these creative endeavors and are determined to make others aware of these treasures which offer new clues to enrich knowledge and understanding. And before we start, I'd like to recognize the cultural historian F. John Herbert for, for preserving and bringing these rich collections to us as the Orville and, J and Jane Rennie collection. So thank you, Mr. Herbert. Please join me in welcoming our guest lecturer, Daryl W. Bullock. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I hope over the next half an hour or 40 minutes or so, I can um, enlighten you a little to, to the, the story of the Cherry Sisters and the importance of the, um, the society's collection. So, and do excuse me if I, if I suddenly burst out laughing. There are some very funny moments in here and even reading through it, I, I, I found it quite difficult to keep a straight face. So um, anyway, here we go. This is the story of how five seemingly untalented women from the same family became huge stars and for a brief period, joined the ranks of the best paid performers on the American stage. It is a story that encapsulates farce tragedy, comedy, and drama. It's a soap opera worthy of the Victorian melodramas the Cherry Sisters often performed on stage. Nothing remains today of the farm that the Cherry family once struggled to maintain, and no sign of the wooden shack built by Thomas Cherry and his children, where the family worked, played, and prayed. Yet it was there that Thomas and Laura Cherry raised their children, and it was there in Lynn County, Iowa, that the story of the infamous Cherry Sisters began. Thomas, Laura, and their two-year-old daughter, Ella, left Massachusetts to build a new life in 1856. Moving west because land was cheap, 
the Cherry families finally settled on a rough 20-acre plot to the south of Marion in 1872. Although it is usually held that most of the Cherry children were born on that farm, in fact, none were. Elizabeth of Viola, Lizzie, and Ada Roselma, or Addie, had been born while the family was in Mount Vernon in 1857 and 1859, respectively. Their son, Nathan Albert, came along in 1863 while the family was living in Lynn Grove, Iowa. Another daughter, Inez, followed two years after that. Effie Isabel Cherry came into the world in 1867, and before she was an two, another girl, Anna, was born. This poor child will not last long. She shows up as a one-year-old on the 1870 census, along with her other siblings, but is never mentioned again. Jessie, the youngest Cherry sister, and her twin brother Alfred were born in Cedar Rapids in November 1871. Sadly, the twins came down with cholera and whooping cough when they were just 10 months old, and although Jessie would recover, Freddie would not. The family struggled to be self-sufficient, with Laura and the older children making clothes, producing their own butter, soap, candles and medicines. The family had their own recipes for everything from snake bites to hemorrhoids, as well as milking cows and collecting eggs. During the summer and fall, Laura and her daughters canned vegetables and soft fruit, and apples, potatoes and other root crops were harvested and stored for winter use. The eldest girls looked after the cows, and they also learned how to dress poultry, plucking the birds their father or brother had dispatched and selling those too. It was not what you might call an easy life, and things became even harder for the family when the mother, Laura, died of pneumonia in 1876. Ella, who had taken a job in Marion, returned to keep house for her father. Now, along with looking after the animals, Lizzie and Addie had to wash, sew, cook, and attend to the needs of their youngest sisters. The barely teenage Nathan worked the land with his father. The family became even more insular, only seen by the neighbours when buying or selling livestock or milk, or at school or in church. The people in Marion began to think of them as a little peculiar. Inez, who had contracted malaria when she was just eight years old, died on Christmas Eve 1884. Not long afterwards, Nathan, who had always seemed unhappy with life on the farm, took off, telling his siblings that he felt there would be more opportunities for him in Illinois. By the time that Thomas Cherry died in June 1888, all communication from his errant son had ceased. And despite many searches over the years, he would never be heard from again. Although they would forever be referred to as orphans, all of the Cherry children, bar 15-year-old Jesse, were adults when their father passed away. Addie moved out to try and add an extra wage packet to the family pot. She soon found a position working at Miss Patterson's boarding house at 10, 12th Street North Marion. One morning in January 1893, Effie Cherry called to deliver milk and Addie greeted her at the door. Addie, she announced, I have made up my mind to give a concert at the Opera House. What do you think of it? Friends offered to lend a hand. Effie approached the manager of the town's Opera House to hire the building and Mary Braska, a local milliner, suggested that they try out their material on some of the young men residing at Miss Patterson's. Eugene Parsons, a meat trader who would later become Marion City clerk, and Owen, a former classmate of Ella's, now the owner of the town drugstore, also encouraged them. Promoted via self-designed posters that the women nailed up around the area, the show featured the Cherry Sisters wearing homemade costumes and, legend has it, with Go Paint, purchased from Carl Owen and left over from their posters, splashed liberally in their hair. 
That first show began with a song from Effie called Father Steer For Me, which received such a roar of applause that it shook the opera house. Jessie then came on stage to play a solo on her mouth organ, which she followed by singing the third Victorian ballad, Why Did They Dig Ma's Grave So Deep? Dressed as a flower girl, she also sang Buy My Flowers, Sweet Lady, Buy, a song she had written but clearly based on Gilbert and Sullivan's I'm Called Little Buttercup. Ella performed a self-penned attempt at a minstrel song entitled Old Sam Patch, dressed in her late father's coat and boots. Ella, Addy and Lizzie capered around the stage in a vague approximation of a dance, while Jessie played the mouth organ and Effie played piano. The Cedar Rapids Gazette claimed that the roar of the audience was so loud that it shook the building. The Cherries were rewarded with $100 for one night's work, which was a huge sum in those days, and more cash than the five women had ever seen before. That windfall and the polite praise from friends and neighbours convinced them um, that it would be a sound financial deal to repeat their performance on a bigger stage. Addie and Effie went to see the manager of Green's Opera House in nearby Cedar Rapids, who, after some persuading, agreed to rent them the hall for $50. On the night of the 17th of February, the auditorium was packed. However, the audience was rowdy, blowing tin horns and throwing missiles at the stage during their performance. The sisters continued with their show despite the pandemonium, but by the end of the evening, it became obvious that they were being mocked. Green's stage manager told the sisters that were they to make a second appearance, then he would have to erect a screen to protect them. But the threat of physical injury from the odd flying shoe was nothing compared to the shame that the sisters felt after reading the review in the Cedar Rapids Gazette. The Gazette insisted that the Cherries couldn't sing, speak or act. They were simply awful. At one minute, the scene was like an incurable ward in an insane asylum. The next, like a Methodist camp meeting. Cigars, cigarettes, rubbers, everything was thrown at them. Yet they stood there awkwardly bowing their acknowledgements and singing on. Possibly the most ridiculous thing of the entire performance was an essay. Think of it, an essay, read by one of the poor girls, in which she pled for the uplifting of the stage and hoped that no one would be harmed by anything they may have witnessed during the evening. The sisters were crushed. The theatre in the 1890s was predominantly a male domain, and men went there in the hope of seeing voluptuous women shown some flesh. The Cherry Sisters offered no such display. Their homemade calico dresses, adorned with bunches of cherries, covered almost every inch of skin. The most the audience could hope for was a glimpse of Jess's bare feet. It must have seemed that at a time when women at home were demanding emancipation, men were exercising misogyny in the comfort of the theatre instead. Incensed at their treatment by the press, Addie marched to the courthouse in Cedar Rapids and demanded the arrest of city editor Fred Davis. More than a dozen local newspapers covered this extraordinary turn of events. And before long, papers in Boston, Chicago and other cities were also reporting on the proceedings. The Gazette came up with a brilliant ruse to hold a mock trial at the Opera House. That confrontation took place on the 14th of March and the capacity audience began barracking as soon as the curtain arose. The Flower Girl skit was met with, was, sorry, the Flower Girl skit was met with hoots of derision as Jesse trampled about the stage with less grace than an elephant would eat soup. After a short pantomime in which Davis was brought at gunpoint to the theatre to answer the charges brought against him, the jury found him guilty and sentenced him to work on the cherry farm and to marry one of the sisters. 
there's no evidence to show that Davis served any part of his sentence. And all five Cherry sisters remained unwed for the rest of their lives. With the newspapers full of stories about their shows, people were desperate to see the Cherries. In Iowa's Marshall Town, their performance was brought to an abrupt end when an egg old enough to vote struck at Je Jesse square in the mouth. The audience at Davenport's Burtis Opera House on the 10th of May were disappointed to discover only Effie and Jesse would appear. Lizzie and Addie had missed their train and Ella, who we can see here, voluntarily left the troupe to stay at home and look after the farm. No matter, for pandemonium reigned supreme and vegetables reigned in quantities from the capacity audience. So much so that the orchestra beat a hasty retreat before the curtain had even gone up. When the curtain finally was raised, the sight of Effie and Jesse standing in front of them, shaking with nerves, momentarily silenced the overexcited audience. Their graceless cantering was compared to a bovine going to pasture. And when Effie took the spotlight and attempted to sing, a potato struck the stage near her with a biff. Then came a volley, including every conceivable vegetable and fruit. In fact, she even got a cake with a sheet iron interior. But it didn't make any difference. She kept right on. When the manager of the house came onto the stage, he too was met with a deluge of sticks, potatoes, even pieces of boards poured down upon him, and a tin horn struck him in the mouth. The curtain was brought down, but the entertainment was far from over. A crowd went to the train station to greet Addie and Lizzie. They were escorted by the police back to the opera house where they were reunited with their sisters, terrified and unable to leave because of the very real threat of a riot breaking out. A week later, the sisters were in Dubuque. The audience at the Grand Opera House came armed with fire extinguishers, siphons, tin horns, decayed eggs, cabbages and other articles. The first girl to appear was struck with a cabbage and received a charge from a siphon. The next got a charge from a fire extinguisher full in the face. Jessie ran from the stage, her blue dress, white stockings and buckled slippers soaked through. At that point, an angry Effie appeared with a shotgun, which she loaded in full view of the audience and brandished menacingly. As more cabbages came, Effie was joined by her sisters, bombarded without mercy. A wash boiler was launched from one of the boxes and almost hit Jessie. But at no point did the police or theatre staff attempt to quell the maddening throng. When the sisters attempted to leave, they were once again greeted by a barrage of eggs and crowds of rowdies gathered on street corners to launch eggs, potatoes, stones and a tin of yellow paint at their carriage as it passed. Fortunately, none of the chairs were badly injured. The sisters threatened the local council with a $20,000 lawsuit and the mayor declared that the affair had been the most scandalous ever that had occurred in Dubuque. In June 1985, an article appeared in the Centre Point Tribune announcing the imminent arrival of the Cherry Sisters. The vegetables are just about the right size to toss on the stage very handily, the only drawback being the smallness of the cabbage heads, editor Charlie Floyd wrote. Johnny, get your gun and the sword and the pistol. Enraged by this very public incitement to take up arms, the sisters went in search of Floyd and set about him with horsewhips, much to the amusement of bystanders. The sisters were arrested, fined $12 each plus costs for the assault on the editor. In La Porte on the 23rd of August 1895, the audience was so boisterous that all the sisters left the stage and went down into the crowd, brandishing weapons. Jessie had a pail of dirty black water thrown over her and was arrested after she struck a young man over the head with a poker. The sisters ended up barricaded inside the theatre while an angry mob waited outside for them. The audience also brought their following performance at the Grundy Centre 
to an abrupt and early end. This time, the sisters, who came armed with clubs, cleared the hall within minutes. Several members of the audience were seen on the street the following day, their heads in bandages. There's no doubt that the sisters and their audience would have benefited from the use of a screen on any of these occasions. Despite witnesses' claims to the contrary, Effie would vehemently deny that they had ever performed behind a screen or any such device. Yet reports about them followed them for their entire career. In New York, less than 12 months after opening his magnificent Olympia Theatre, the first ever theatre in Times Square, Oscar Hammerstein was facing huge debts. The building had cost a fortune and had a huge wages bill and patrons were not filling the seats. Audiences were tired of highbrow European acts. And so he began to look around the United States for an attraction that would set the town talking. His curiosity was piqued by a series of reports concerning a troop of women from Iowa who had a great many things to learn, among them the proper method of protecting themselves from wash boilers, cannonballs, stove wood, cabbages and unsavoury hen fruit. The women, on the, the, the women on the receiving end of the rotten eggs were, of course, the Cherry Sisters. The sisters made their New York debut on the 11th of November, 1896, and the catcalls started within seconds. When they sang, Cherries Ripe, Boomdier, someone in the auditorium called back, Cherries are rotten, and the rest of the audience soon joined in. The New York Times, which reviewed the evening's entertainment under the heading Four Freaks from Iowa, branded the sisters coarse, gawky and stupid and informed their readers that while three of them are tall and angular, the fourth is very short and weighs 170 pounds. The Chicago Daily Tribune noted that Addie, Lizzie, Jessie and Effie cannot sing, cannot act and are gaunt and homely to the point of despair. They are so bad, they are uproariously funny. Within a fortnight of their first appearance, Hammerstein had made enough to pay off his creditors. And women in New York began to wear cherry-coloured ribbons in their hair and to pin bunches of cherries to their clothing in place of corsages. Everywhere you went, people were wearing Cherry Sisters button badges. And everyone who was anyone including future President Woodrow Wilson, came to see them. Comedians satirised them, including Murray Dressler, who burlesqued Jessie's barefoot flower girl skit to uproarious laughter. News of their New York triumph travelled fast, bringing in offers from around the country. In fact, so busy were they that a rumour spread around the vaudeville circuit that the Cherry sisters appearing on stage were imposters and that the real thing was back in Iowa. The sisters had no need to employ others to stand in for the real thing. However, that did not prevent other acts from trying to cash in on their infamy. In early January, they received word that Duncan Clark's lady minstrels were passing themselves off as the Cherry sisters. Clark was promoting his show as featuring four ripe Cherry Sisters, direct from New York. In early June, stories began to appear in the press that the Cherry Sisters had been reduced to a trio. During an engagement in Des Moines, Addie, Effie and Jessie had discovered that Lizzie was secreting money away and that she was boasting of being the most talented of the bunch. Things came to a head after an argument over money, and the others refused to let Lizzie appear after harsh language was used. With dates to fill, the sisters sent for Ella. Ella did not remain long, and soon after, the Cherry sisters had officially become a trio. On the 17th of January, 1898, the three sisters played Smith's Armory in Iowa City. Even for an act used to disorderly conduct, 
the date of the armory performance would go down as one they would rather forget. The armory, which could hold 1,200 people, was full to capacity a good hour before the Cherry Sisters were due on stage. And the eggs and rotting vegetation, excuse me, and the eggs and rotting vegetation they brought with them was already flying around the hall before the curtain went up. The audience was informed that the cherries would not appear unless they settled down and an uneasy hush descended. Nevertheless, no sooner had the sisters begun with Jesse banging the big bass drum while Addy and Effie puffed themselves up, readying to sing eulogy on the cherry sisters, that vegetables and tin cans rained down upon them. The curtain was immediately closed. Once the noise had abated, the curtains parted again to reveal Effie standing there quaking in her boots. An egg hit her in the face and she fell to the floor. Understandably, the sisters refused to continue. At this point, the audience rushed the stage and the three women were hurried out of the building. The crowd demanded their money back. People began to rip up the seats in the auditorium. A mob gathered outside the sisters' hotel, singing songs and letting off fireworks. In at least one report, one of the sisters is said to have opened a window and emptied a chamber pot onto the crowd below. Several windows were broken and some men got inside the hotel where they began beating on the door of the sisters' room. The police were called who fired blanks to try and stem the riot. In desperation, the fire department was called out and two hoses were turned on the mob. The reception they received in most of the places they played was rather boisterous. So there was no reason why their show in Sack City on the 10th of February would stand out. That show, like many others, was brought to an early end by the audience, which was so noisy that just four numbers into their programme, the girls refused to continue. Yet when the manager of the theatre brought the curtain down, the audience refused to leave and they continued to hurl abuse and missiles at the stage for over an hour. The Old Boat Chronicle printed a scathing front page review titled, The Cherries Were Here. When the curtain went up, the audience saw three creatures surpassing the witches in Macbeth in general hideousness. Effie is an old jade of 50 summers, Jesse, a frisky filly of 40, and Addie, the flower of the family, a capering monstrosity of 35. Their long skinny arms, equipped with talons at the extremities, swung mechanically, and soon were waved frantically at the suffering spectators. The mouths of their rancid features opened like caverns, and sounds like the wailing of damned souls issued therefrom. They pranced around the stage with a motion that suggested a cross between a dance du ventre and a foxtrot. Strange creatures with painted faces and hideous mien. Effie is spavined, Addie is knock-kneed and string halt, and Jessie, the only one who showed her stockings, has legs without calves, as classic in their outlines as the curves of a broom handle. Penned by editor Billy Hamilton, it was the most scurrilous piece published so far. When it reappeared in the Des Moines Leader, the women decided enough was enough. A petition was filed against the publishers of the Leader. The trial drew a large and unruly crowd, and what should have been a solemn occasion quickly descended into farce. The representatives of the leader stated that the sisters' performance were coarse and farcical, wholly without merit and ridiculous. Hamilton stated that his critique was realistic and I wrote up the show in the way it impressed me. It was the oddest thing I'd ever witnessed. Legend maintains that the sisters performed for the jury, but this is not the case. However, the presiding judge told the court that he had seen them perform 
and was in the perfect position to deliver his verdict. In the judge's opinion, the leader showed no malice. Although they lost, Addy had no intention of letting the matter go. And the case of Addy Cherry versus the Des Moines leader was put forward to the Supreme Court of Iowa. The verdict was delivered on May 28th, 1901. If ever there was a case justifying ridicule and sarcasm, it is the one before us now. According to the record, the performance given by the plaintiffs was not only childish, but ridiculous in the extreme. A dramatic critic should be allowed suitable license in such a case. The public should be informed of the character of the entertainment and the publication should be privileged. That one short paragraph changed the libel laws in the United States forever. The case is still quoted from in law textbooks today. And no matter what else they may have achieved, from that point on, the Cherry Sisters became an indelible part of the US culture. As 1903 began, it must have appeared to the sisters that after a full decade of treading the boards, their years in a spotlight were at an end. Few paying dates were forthcoming. With the farm barely providing enough income for Ella and Lizzie, the three performing sisters decided to turn their hands to running a business. Although it was widely held that the sisters had made a fortune and that they had invested much of that money in land, the truth of the matter is that the women were barely scraping by. Unscrupulous managers and agents had taken advantage of the sisters' naivety and had taken much of their earnings. Addy, Effie and Jessie threw themselves into the running of the dining room of the Sumter Hotel in Hot Springs, where they rechristened, sorry, which they rechristened the Iowa Pure Food House, before being offered the chance to run an entire boarding house, restaurant, getting rooms and all, the Reservation Inn in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Yet despite all of their hard work, there was little the Cherries could do to encourage boarders or diners to patronise their business. Then Jesse and Effie were both struck down with typhoid, and an anxious Lizzie went to out to help Addie look after the two younger women. Effie quickly improved, but on the 30th of September, Jesse died. Her passing devastated the four remaining sisters and forced the family act into retirement. Addie and Effie returned to Marion to seek solace in the embrace of their sisters, but did not stay long. Although most reports had it that the women were living as one happy family, that was simply not the case. Ella did not approve of their lifestyle and relations with Lizzie were still fraught. So Addie and Effie left the two older women and returned to their own rented house in Cedar Rapids. After a few months at home, Effie got itchy feet and decided that she wanted to go back out onto the road. Addie was reluctant, but after some persuading came along too. The Cherry Sisters duo, occasionally enlarged to a trio by Lizzie, were on tour again by the summer of 1904. While they were away from home, news reached them that a newspaper reporter in Portsmouth, Ohio, had in his possession three recordings featuring Jesse that he was prepared to sell them to the sisters for $100. It's unknown if the three records, probably Edison cylinders, contained three different recordings or if there were simply three copies of Jesse singing Fair Columbia. Although they would never acquire the recordings, Addy and Effie stated that the three of them had recorded in Cedar Rapids, which leaves the tantalizing prospect that someone, somewhere, may well own recordings by Addy, Effie, and Jesse Cherry, either solo or together. Ever since the first commercial screening of a moving picture, demand for live acts had been in decline. Theatres were closing or converting into picture houses, and the vaudeville circuit that had provided the sisters a living was changing beyond all recognition. 
when Congress voted to declare war on Germany in April, in April 1917, conscription took a huge number of men away from their homes, their loved ones, and away from the theatres and opera houses. Now off the road, but still in need of an income, Addy and Effie decided to concentrate their efforts on a little home bakery they had run from rooms at the front of the rented house on 3rd Avenue West, Cedar Rapids. The sisters offered fresh Jersey milk, homemade bread, rolls, and naturally cherry pies. But Effie returned, Effie yearned to return to the stage, I'm sorry. When offers came her way, she took them, and as always, the ever loyal Addie came along too. We have rather enjoyed the bakery business for a change, Effie explained, but now we are tired of it and are anxious to go back. The newspapers followed the latest developments with great interest, but sadly dates were few and far between. The world was changing and for the Cherry sisters, opportunities were vanishing. Vaudeville's biggest flop entering political arena, the headline in Variety screamed. Effie Cherry was to stand for election as mayor of her adopted city, just five years after women in Iowa were given the right to vote. Her mailbox was flooded with letters of support from fans and politicians alike. She railed against public parks, gymnasiums, bathing beaches, and the sight of a young woman's bare flesh. Lewd literature and immoral entertainment had to go. When I am mayor, I'll have the curfew bell ring at 9 p.m., she told reporters. I'm not a Democrat, Republican, or Socialist, but I'm going to run on a blue platform and I'll win. Sadly, she did not. When the results were in, it was announced that she had polled 805 votes. Her two male opponents polled more than 3,000 each. She stood again two years later, coming third once more. After losing the election, Effie and Addy went back to the stage. They struggled to make ends meet, and although the sisters claimed that their time as bakers was over, they would continue with the operation sporadically over the next few years. But with little income from the bakery, the farm fully signed over to Ella, and the Great Depression tightening its grip, Addy and Effie would be obliged to take whatever work came their way, no matter how menial or beneath them. Every time they appeared before the footlights, it was billed as an attempt at a comeback. However, the sisters balked at any suggestion that they had ever retired. By the end of 1932, any money that Addy and Effie had managed to sort away had long gone. The bakery was gone too. And Addy and Effie moved to three sparsely furnished rented rooms at 323 3rd Avenue Southwest. Within a year, they would move again to 627th Street. If life was treating Addie and Effie badly, their lot was nothing compared to that of their two sisters. Ella was now nearly 80 years old and Lizzie just three years younger. It had become impossible for the two women to keep up with incessant repairs and they moved into the basement of the house. By February 1934, the conditions that they were living in had attracted the interest of the local authorities. And while Addy and Effie were playing small venues in the East, both Ella and Lizzie were hospitalized. After a short stay in St. Luke's Hospital, the two women were transferred to the Lynn County home, where on the 12th of March, 1934, Ella passed away. Once the funeral was over, Lizzie, exhibiting the infamous cherry streak of stubbornness, demanded that she should be allowed to return to the family home. Not that it was much of a home to return to. Addy and Effie found some comfort in rehashing the gypsies' warning for their home crowd on stage at the Iowa Theatre Picture House. Once again, their 1934 tour was heralded as a comeback, and this time around, pianist Carl White accompanied the sisters. White was an experienced performer who had played piano for a number of other acts. And as well as accompanying the sisters, he also handled any managerial responsibilities. Addie and Effie were seeing little financial return for their efforts. And they hated the fact 
that White was openly promoting them as the world's worst vaudeville act. Their relationship with White was strained, but in September 1934, in what seemed little more than a pathetic publicity stunt, he announced to the press that he had asked Effie to marry him. While Addie and Effie were suffering the indignity of recycling their act for indifferent nightclub patrons, poor Lizzie was becoming more and more frail. She died on the 11th of May, 1936, aged 79. Weak from scratching out a living in the damp, leaking shack she and the rest of her family had once called home, she succumbed to pneumonia and died in hospital in Cedar Rapids. In April 1938, the two sisters made their final appearance on a stage, where they played for four nights at the Strand Theatre in Cedar Rapids. This would be the last time that a paying audience would get to see Addie and Effie perform, and capacity crowds greeted the sisters. On the 25th of October 1942, at the age of 83, Adi Roselma Cherry died in hospital in Cedar Rapids from a cerebral hemorrhage. She had been ill for just five days. Her funeral took place three days later and she was buried in the Murdoch Linwood Cemetery. Effie, who herself had been unwell for some time, was destroyed. Of all the sisters, it was the passing of Adi, her lifelong companion, her partner in crime, her staunchest ally that was the hardest to bear. Addie's death broke Effie's heart. She went into a steep decline and was hospitalized almost immediately after the funeral. Effie remained in her bed at Cedar Rapids Mercy Hospital for more than two months. Her final indignity was to be alone, the orphan she had always claimed to be. Death came for Effie on the 5th of August, 1944, just a few weeks short of her 77th birthday. Frail and gaunt, and with a long history of poor health, she was admitted into a nursing home just a few days before she took her final bow. Shortly before, Effie wrote to Carl White, telling him that, I have lost all my sisters. The last one was darling Addie. So far it has been hard for me to bear, but I know she will be with me all the time and that life will not be so lonely. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that little um, look at the career of the Cherry Sisters. There you go. Um, any questions, I guess? Okay, we're gonna do some questions now. Um, thanks, Daryl, that was great. I think we all really enjoyed that. Uh, and happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. <clears throat> um, the first question is, uh, what was the year of the February 10th performance in Sac City? Oh gosh, <laughs> I'll have to check now. Um, it would have been, it was before they went to New York. So it would have been around, um, 1894, five, okay. I'll have to check. It's in the book. <laughs> That's that. okay. That's good enough for me. Um, let's see. Okay. <clears throat> Are the Cherry Sisters unique in American entertainment? Um, were there efforts to find bad entertainment? They weren't unique. Well, they were unique in lots of ways, I think, personally. I think they were unique in the fact that there were five women doing something incredibly um, brave at a time when women just weren't allowed to do that. And certainly to try and do it without um, management from men was, in, it was an incredibly brave thing to do. Um, I, I kind of think of the Cherries as kind of being, you know, pioneers, of femi feminist pioneers in a way. Um, what they were doing was, was just incredible, if you think about it, managing to run their own business, managing to, you know, carve out a 40 plus year career um, but they weren't unique. There were other acts. Um, there have been acts for centuries. You can go back two centuries beforehand and find similar acts being kind of, you know, having rotten fruit, fruit or whatever thrown at them on stage. It was, um, 
it wasn't unusual to happen in in a in a vaudeville or in an opera house at that time. Okay. Um, do you think would you consider the audience as part of their act? I think if you look at it as as a kind of as a happening as an event, um, then it kind of is, isn't it? It's um, it's all part and parcel of what makes the Cherry Sisters so fascinating is that the audience does in a way become part of the act. And certainly um, at, at one point in the career, the sisters realize that what they're doing and what the audience, how the audience is reacting is one of the reasons why they get bookings. They're not stupid, they understand what's going on. So although they might not have played up to it, they, they certainly realize that it, it was, it was a thing. It was. It was a. You know. It was something that they were. They were recognised for, and it made it easier for them to get bookings. Okay. Um, I don't know if you know uh, the answer to this, since you're not um, here in the states. But somebody was asking if you knew if any of their homes were still standing, and somebody had commented that they thought some of them were demolished in Cedar Rapids. But I didn't know if any of them still existed. If you knew about that. Well, the. the the original home in Marion definitely doesn't exist. That's gone. Uh, my understanding is the the, the bakeries in because the, they had two bakeries on either side of the road at different time. Uh, I believe they're both gone. Uh, I'm not sure about the later lodgings they took. If those buildings are still standing, I don't okay. know. I have to look into that. That's interesting. Um, another question someone had is they were promoted as world famous. But did they ever leave the country to perform um, or for the international press? No, they didn't. <laughs> uh, they were they were also promoted as being um, the uh, the World's Fair Cherry Sisters, and they never went to the World's Fair either, apart from as as visitors. They never performed there. Um, no, but that's it, again, that's one of those strange things that happens. I've seen other artists um, um, that, that have claimed to kind of toured internationally and they, they never left the States at all. It, it happened quite a lot. It was, um, I think it was assumed if you read a newspaper on one coast, you didn't read a, a newspaper on the other coast, you didn't really know what was going on. And, um, there was a lot of, um, shall we say misinformation going on, but no, I'm not aware of them ever leaving the country apart from to go to, um, Canada. Okay. That's about as far as they went. Sure. Um, and I think you mentioned this, but somebody was asking about there's no recordings. I think we talked about that the other day that we're hoping that somebody will just stumble upon them, but there's none that exist, at least now that we know of, right? There are none that have been found yet. There okay. were recordings made. There were recordings made in Cedar Rapids. There was at one point um, in, in 1905, this discovery of three Edison cylinders we don't know what's on them. One is believed to be uh, Jessie performing Fair Columbia, which is a song that she, she performed on stage wrapped in a, a, a Stars and Stripes. One was reported to be that. We don't know what's on the other two. It might They might just be copies of the same recording. They may be others. Although, as I said in the talk, um, Effie and Addy, in a letter around that time, uh, stated that all three uh, women had recorded Okay. Do you know if they have it ever appeared on the radio or in newsreels? I've not seen any newsreels, but they definitely appeared on the radio. At, at the end of their career, the last few years, uh, they made several appearances on radio, and Effie also gave uh, political speeches on radio. I've not come across any transcription discs of them, but again, it's, one th it's something that could exist. They could be okay. out there somewhere. And they're okay. just gathering dust in somebody's archive until somebody you know uncovers them. Okay, well, um, I think that's about it for the questions. Um, and if anybody's interested, there's a deal going until Sunday that you get 20% off the book that Daryl wrote if you'd like to. Um, and the link is in the chat. I think that's all we have. But we really appreciate you doing this today. It was so fun and it's a hilarious and it's just such an interesting story. Oh, you're welcome. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I, I, I hope I didn't get garble or, or talk too fast. And um, and I hope you managed to get and it's 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 been a pleasure. It's a shame we can't do these things in, in person at the moment. I know. <laughs> but um at some point in the future, hopefully. Sounds good. Okay. Well, thank you, Daryl.